Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. It's five-year mission. Star Trek was the brainchild of one Eugene Wesley Roddenberry. Gene was born in El Paso, Texas on August 19, 1921. He grew up loving science fiction pulp magazines and was a big fan of the John Carter of Mars series. When he got older, he entered World War II as a bomber pilot, where he flew 89 combat missions in the Army Air Forces. Gene then worked as a commercial pilot when the war was over. Not long after, he joined the Los Angeles Police Force, where he started to try his hand at writing for television. In March of 1964, Gene drew up a 16-page draft of a proposed TV series that he called Star Trek. It was to be set on board a huge interstellar spaceship called the SS Yorktown. Its crew would explore the Milky Way galaxy on a weekly basis. At this point, Star Trek only showed a passing resemblance to the TV series we now know. The show was originally influenced by many things, including the popular science fiction movie Forbidden Planet, Eric Frank Russell's marathon series of stories, and A.E. Van Vogt's tales of the spaceship Space Beagle. Roddenberry was also a huge fan of the Horatio Hornblower novels, which focused on the main character, who is an extremely intelligent and courageous sea captain who is very introspective and doubtful of his own abilities. He would sometimes refer to Captain Kirk as Horatio Hornblower in space. Roddenberry also wrote for many TV series about the Old West and wanted to give Star Trek an old Western vibe, but only set in space in the future. He modeled the show around the popular Western TV series of the time called Wagon Train, which featured a self-contained story every week. In fact, he described the show as Wagon Train to the Stars. In the original concept, the captain of the ship was Robert April of the starship SS Yorktown. This character was later changed to Captain Christopher Pike, portrayed by Jeffrey Hunter. As an interesting side note, Captain Robert April made his only appearance in the Star Trek universe in Star Trek the Animated Series episode, The Counter Clock Incident. In early 1964, Roddenberry first pitched the idea to MGM. They liked the idea, but declined to make him an offer. Then Gene brought the draft to Desilu Productions, which was a small independent production company owned by comedian Lucille Ball. They wanted to produce the show, but at the time, Desilu only had one successful series in The Lucy Show and was having some financial difficulties. Roddenberry went to speak with Desilu's vice president of production, Oscar Katz, and the two of them devised a plan to sell the series to a network. They first took it to CBS. However, CBS wasn't interested because at the time, they already had another science fiction series in development by the name of Lost in Space. Next on their list was NBC. Herbert Salo, Desilu's director of production, had previously worked at NBC and brought the concept to Grant Tinker. Tinker was then head of the West Coast Programming Department and loved what he saw, and he okayed the production of the first Star Trek pilot, The Cage. The programming heads loved the pilot, but the sales and marketing departments turned it down as they thought it was much too cerebral and needed more action. They felt it would be too hard to promote. At this point, Star Trek was dead before it could even get off the ground. Roddenberry then begged NBC for another chance, saying he could make the show more action-oriented. Herbert Salo again stepped in and tried to convince studio head Lucille Ball that she had a winner on her hands and she should continue financing the show. Without his intervention, Star Trek might never have been made. In a weird twist of fate, NBC then made the highly unusual decision to fund the second pilot episode. The second pilot, where no man has gone before, was a smash hit with the executives at NBC, and a green light was given to a full season of Star Trek. Suddenly, Roddenberry needed scripts for the new series, and he needed them fast. Panic was setting in, and the word was sent out to science fiction authors and TV writers for much-needed script ideas. It was at this point that one of Roddenberry's own staff, a fledgling writer herself, stepped up to the plate. That writer was Gene's own personal assistant, Dorothy Fontana, who went on to pen some of the series' most celebrated episodes, including Journey to Babel, which introduced us to Spock's parents. 
Dorothy was credited as DC Fontana because at the time, not many women were writing for television and she didn't want to be judged by any gender prejudice. In fact, she also wrote under other male pseudonyms like Michael Bingham and Michael Richards and also wrote for the series The Wild Wild West as Michael Edwards. As the debut date of Star Trek approached, NBC chose an episode called Man Trap as the show's premiere episode. The episode itself was a somewhat mediocre episode, but it did introduce us to the main characters that would later become the iconic characters that we would all come to love. Roddenberry wanted Jeffrey Hunter to return as Captain Christopher Pike, which he played in the first pilot episode. But when he set up a screening of the cage pilot for Jeff, reserving a projection room at Desilu, Jeff never showed. Instead, he sent his wife, who told Roddenberry that this just wasn't the type of show that Jeffrey wanted to do. Charismatic Canadian actor William Shatner was then hired to play the part of Captain James T. Kirk. In the script selected for the second pilot, only two of the original pilot actors were retained. Those actors were Leonard Nimoy and Majel Barrett, respectively, although Ms. Barrett's character was changed from the second in command named number one to Nurse Christine Chapel. Leonard Nimoy, who thought that playing the part of an emotionless alien was going to kill his fledgling acting career, was suddenly able to play off the extremely emotional Shatner and the true Mr. Spock emerged. At this point, the realities of producing a weekly science fiction show like Star Trek were becoming very clear. Desi Liu, a small studio, just didn't have the finances available to maintain an expensive, effects-heavy show like Star Trek. At the same time, they were producing another expensive show by the name of Mission Impossible. Each episode of Star Trek was budgeted at $200,000, with the network footing around 80% of the bill. Anything over that, Desi Liu had to provide, and the show frequently went over budget. By the second season, Desi Liu was drowning in debt and was forced to sell the rights to Star Trek to Paramount Studios. Star Trek, the original series, was never the big ratings blockbuster that they had hoped for, and it lingered low in the ratings each season. In fact, the show in previous years would probably have been canceled due to its low ratings. However, the network was aware of the show's quality target audience, and that was the likely reason they continued to support the show throughout the second season, even with steadily falling ratings. What attacked you? They say there's no devil, Jim. But there is a... Right out of hell, I saw it! Favorable demographics and a large letter-writing campaign by loyal fans likely caused NBC to renew the show for a third season. NBC reported receiving over 116,000 letters between December 1967 and March of 1968, imploring the network to renew the show. According to one unnamed executive, the network actually received over one million pieces of mail, but only chose to disclose the lower figure. In its third season, NBC made a decision that would cause the show's cancellation. They decided to move its time slot to Friday nights at 10 p.m., effectively losing its younger audience. Roddenberry tried to get the network to give the show a better time slot, but wasn't able to do so. Exhausted by his frustration with the network, he decided to take a hands-off approach in the show's third season, and Fred Freeberger took over as producer. NBC also reduced Star Trek's budget in season three, which many believe caused a decline in the show's quality. While there were still many excellent episodes in that third season, there was an obvious reduction in production costs and script quality. Star Trek, the original series last day of filming, was January the 9th, 1969, with a total of 79 episodes in the can. But of course, that's not the end of the story as we all know. Kaiser Broadcasting had already picked up the syndication rights to Star Trek and was showing it as an alternative to the network evening news in several large markets, including New York and Philadelphia. In fact, it gathered such a large audience in syndication that it went on to become a cult classic and eventually raised interest in a TV revival series. In fact, Star Trek, to this day, continues to live long and prosper. We hope that you enjoyed this walk down Star Trek's memory lane. Join us again for more movie and TV trivia, insights, and reviews on Rerun Zone. Goodbye for now.